name is Jose Puyana, and I'm the head of ProColombia's office in the UK. Welcome to the Colombia Investment Roadshow, our flagship initiative in Europe for promoting FDI opportunities in Colombia, and which is today hosting participants from all around the world. In addition to this series of webinars, this platform will facilitate one-to-one -one meetings between investors and over 70 project developers in Colombia. This event is only possible thanks to the support and commitment of each of the partners behind the initiative. The UK's Department for International Trade, the British Embassy in Colombia, the British Colombian Chamber of Commerce, the Colombian Embassy to the UK, Control Risks, EY, and of course, ProColombia's network of offices in Europe. Today, we begin with the first of our live webinars, Colombia's economic recovery and the role of FDI, where we will look into our country's economic perspectives and how we are turning this crisis into an opportunity. We are delighted to have three fabulous speakers to lead this discussion. Colombia's Trade Minister, Jose Manuel Restrepo, Flavia Santoro, President of ProColombia, and the FT's Latin American editor, Michael Stott. The webinar will be moderated by Oliver Walk, General Manager for Colombia and the Andrian Region at Control Risks. Let me tell you how the event will be structured. After opening remarks by President Ivan Duque, the moderator will introduce the speakers and will guide the discussion. Before closing, we will open it up for Q&A. So please use the chat box function and indicate who the question is for. The webinar will end at 2.20 British time, 3.20 Central European time. For those of you who want to follow along later, recordings of the series of webinars will be available on the event, web, on the event website and on our YouTube channel. If you are an investor and still haven't requested a meeting with Colombian project developers, please do so using the chat box below and following the instructions provided. The details of each of the projects is available on the event website. Thanks again for joining us today. I leave you with this message from the President of Colombia, after which Oliver will take over the lead for the rest of the event. Thank you. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the new edition of the Colombia Investment Roadshow in which we share with British and European investors why Colombia is a great destination for business expansion and development. In the difficult times that we're living due to the coronavirus pandemic and its huge socioeconomic impact, this roadshow becomes a symbol of resilience and hope for a better future for all. Investors from around the world continue to show interest and confidence in Colombia as an ideal country for doing business. This statement is demonstrated by the growth and the increase of incoming international capital in comparison to previous years. In the first quarter of 2020, non-mining foreign direct investment reached more than $2.4 billion, representing a 23% increase compared to 2019. In the midst of the current situation, we have surveyed more than 200 foreign companies with operations in Colombia in a joint effort with the Coalition of Regional Investment Promotion Agencies, and we have seen their interest in our country. To make Colombia even more attractive, we have been strengthening facilitation mechanisms and incentives for investors, as well as creating a more successful environment for business to grow and expand. Furthermore, we are promoting an incentive program to become an ideal destination for international companies looking to relocate in order to reorganize their supply chains in response to the global circumstances. During these three days of Roadshow, you will have the opportunity to see more than 70 projects with potential in receiving investment that will contribute with the dynamic of generating more growth in our country. These sectors have projects such as highways, that foresee investment for more than $5.3 billion. The recovery of the navigability of our country's main watercourse, as well as the modernization of airports and the implementation of large-scale solar projects, among others. I would like to thank the British government and our partners in the United Kingdom for their collaborative work 
in developing this platform and extraordinary opportunities to show why Colombia is an answer for investors all over the world. Please enjoy these days of productive dialogues, opportunities, and upcoming business projects in our country. Welcome to Colombia. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. To uh, ProColombia, uh, the organizers and the sponsors of uh, this event and today's session, thank you very much for having me on this panel about Colombia's economic recovery and the role of foreign direct investment. I speak on behalf of Control Risks. We've been in Colombia for over 40 years, watching the country's transformation and advance on the path towards economic growth and prosperity. For me, seeing this investment roadshow and at this point in time, as President Duque mentioned, to be speaking and hearing about potential opportunities is really very gratifying indeed. To all the participants dialing in from across the globe uh, for this session, thank you very much for taking the time. Um, the panelists and myself will do um, the utmost we can to make sure that you get the most out of the session. To the panelists, thank you very much in advance for what I'm sure will be a very interesting and very engaging conversation. No pressure. In terms of introductions uh, of our panelists, we will not go through the full biographies. You can find those on the website of the event if you click where it says see speaker lineup. Briefly, however, we do have with us today Jose Manuel Restrepo, Colombia's Minister for Trade, Industry and Tourism. He's an economist and he specializes, uh, specializes in finances. He has degrees from Rosario University, um, the London School of Economics and Inalde. We also have with us Michael Stott, the Latin America editor at the Financial Times. Uh, he was uh, previously based in Asia, uh, where he worked for the Nikkei Asian Review. Um, and before that, he was the FT's UK news editor. He's also previously lived in Colombia and across other parts of the region in the 1990s. The format for the conversation will be um, introductory remarks by each panelist for about 20 minutes, and then we will have a question and answer session. And if you do have any questions, please do submit those via the chat function in the app. Now, before we kick it off, I would actually like to hand it over to Ms. Flavia Santoro, the president of ProColombia First, for some opening remarks and also a more formal introduction of Minister Restrepo. Flavia, over to you. Welcome to the third edition of the Colombia Investment Roadshow a platform created in 2018 that since then has grown exponentially. I would like to start by expressing our gratitude to a start to the team that made this event possible. These allies have been working alongside the Colombian government and our team at ProColombia for several years now to showcase the best business opportunities our country has to offer. I would like to thank the British Embassy in Colombia I would like to thank the Department for International Trade, the British and Colombian Chamber of Commerce, EY and Control Risks, and the Colombian Embassy in the United Kingdom for your efforts in making this year's event possible. This is a very plat important platform for ProColombia that has grown into a major business promotion activity in the UK and now is successfully reaching other markets in Europe. Thanks to digital tools, we are able to welcome global firms to this gathering, where we will present Colombia's economic trend and growing perspectives and introduce investors to 74 projects from sectors such as infrastructure, energy, agribusiness, technology, real estate, and waste management. Let me share with you some details about these investment opportunities. In the infrastructure sectors, projects include key toll roads, airports, telecommunication infrastructure, schools, and R&D centers around Colombia, as our president mentioned. Fundamentally, the roadshow will showcase 18 Colombian companies and startups in the tech and innovation segment. All of them are looking for partnerships and international investors. One third of them are related to fintech solutions, while the rest are focused on artificial intelligence, software development, and other creative ventures. And finally, in the energy sector, the projects promoted in this roadshow focus on renewable energy generation in different regions of the country. The numbers show that we have been successful in attracting the interest of both 
investors, and projects. We have, up until now, more than 1,200 1, people registered for these webinars and over 170 meetings set up between investors and projects. These numbers are unprecedented, and we are certainly very glad all of you have decided to join us. Today's webinar session will focus on the actions Colombia is taking to ensure a speedy recovery of our economy. We strongly believe that our country is and will continue to be a success story. Colombia enjoys solid fundamentals that make this purpose a reality. I would like to mention some of them. Political and economic stability, fiscal discipline, a strategic geographical location, and the best of all, talented people. Additionally, according to the World Bank, Colombia's economic forecasts for 2020 continue to be one of the best at the regional level, even at this juncture. For Latin America, the forecast is for an average decrease of 7.2%, and that of Colombia is of 4.9%. For 2021, we expect a rebound in the economy. According to the International Monetary Fund, next year, Colombia will grow at 3.7, while according to World Bank estimates in 2021, we will grow at 3.6%. Moreover, a few months ago, Colombia, Colombia became officially the 37th member of the OECD, joining Mexico and Chile from Latin America in this select group of countries. What this proves is our country's concern for following international policy standards in a wide variety of areas. Thanks to these fundamentals, our country is the third largest recipient of foreign investment in Latin America and is among the 30 countries which receive the greatest amount of investment worldwide. We are sure that the desire and opportunity to invest in Colombia has never been greater. This is supported by the 25% year-on-year increase of incoming international capital that we saw in 2019. But in the first quarter of 2020, non-mining for indirect investment reached more than $2.4 billion, representing a 23% increase compared to 2019. And during the first semester, ProColombia has contributed to the arrival of 102 investments initiatives worth $5.6 billion, according to the investors themselves. This will generate 37,000 new jobs. Aware of all these facts that allow us to remain optimistic for the future, we have been working together with the guide of our Vice President, Marta Lucia Ramirez, and the Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Tourism in the construction of a forceful and effective economic reactivation plan. This strategy includes an incentive plan with very specific measures that will allow Colombia to stand out as a regional leader in terms of attracting foreign direct investment. The plan is titled Moving Forward with Confidence, will be launched soon and we'll make sure you get all the details. Now, I would like to introduce Colombia's Minister for Trade, Industry and Tourism, Jose Manuel Restrepo, who will share with you how Colombia is turning the current crisis into an opportunity and why the role of foreign direct investment is now more than ever a key pillar of Colombia's economic recovery. Minister Restrepo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Flavia. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to be in this meeting. And I have to tell you that it's, uh, it's an honor for me to be in this Colombia Investment Roadshow. I know that today we have the third version of the Colombia Investment Roadshow. And I would like to greet Oliver Walk also Michael Stott, and also, also to all the participants, investors from different countries, especially from the UK, and also from you who are taking part on this, on this meeting. I have to tell you also that I want to greet all the government officials from Colombia, our ambassador at the UK, and other European countries that, who are taking part on this conversation. And let me uh, begin by 
saying that uh, for me it's a pity not to be in London today, but maybe maybe the next year I will have the chance to be with you and, and to have the fourth, by that moment, version of the Colombia Investment Roadshow. Let me begin by saying that one year ago, we were telling you how successfully we were confronting the change of our page in the history of Colombia. And by that moment, uh, we were saying that we were moving from the page of violence and terrorism to a new page, the page that President Ivan Duque wants to invite us, a page of investment, a page of entrepreneurship, a page of innovation. And I have to tell you that things were, by that moment, on the right track. We were having the highest growth in Latin America. Even the first three months of 2020, compared to other similar countries, we were also having the highest growth on GDP. By the end of last year, with those good news, we were launching a fiscal reform coherent with uh, the idea of President Duque of how to build a pro-private initiative country, a pro-business country. And we were having record numbers in our history, record on tourists, on service exports, on agro-exports, also on commerce at local markets, and even in terms of growth on uh, foreign and direct investment. However, something unexpected appeared, COVID-19. That doesn't mean that we have lost the path. That only means that now we needed to use maybe our most powerful tool and characteristic of being Colombians. That tool is resilience. And resilience, if you go to, back to the 80s or 70s or 90s in our country, with such difficult moments, by those periods in Colombia, we were able to deal with them and grow. How is that possible? Because Colombians know how to adapt, how to reinvent us, how to recover, how to especially overcome bad moments and build not only a new normality, but a better normality. How to do it? By putting life and health as the essence. We don't see a dilemma between life, health, and economics. Of course, life will be always at the top. Without life, there is no economy. And of course, that means testing strategies active testing strategies. One month and a half before, we were having per day 2,000 uh, tests. Now we are having more than 21,000 tests per day. It also means producing protection elements, masks, gloves, uniforms, reconverting our textile and apparel industry, protecting eldest people of those or those with comorbidity. The result, you can see it uh, on the chart, is one of the lowest countries in terms of fatality rates compared to the total population, compared to many other countries in the world. We have also implemented traceability strategies. But going back to the dilemma, life, health versus economy, we also know that without economy, we will not have money to sustain our health system and guarantee life. We don't want a pandemic of coronavirus, but we also don't want a pandemic of unemployment, poverty, productive destruction. That's why we have also two objectives. How to work with the most vulnerable people, improving social programs, and giving resources to the poorest of the poorest people in our country in the middle of lockdowns. Today, more than 30 million Colombians receive uh, new social benefits in our country per month. And this also includes, among many other measures, how to solve liquidity difficulties for small and medium enterprises, or new credit lines, new guarantee lines, how to give financial solvency, solving the risk 
uh, and maybe the appetite in the financial sector by guaranteeing billions of dollars for small and medium enterprises, up to 90%. How to extend dates for payments of taxes? How to accelerate the devolution of taxes? And more recently, how to give even direct subsidies to pay wage premiums, for example, and even monthly wages for certain periods of time. And that means, as in the chart, more than 165 measures to mitigate the impact. That also means investing between 9 to 11% of our GDP. However, as I said before, Colombian resilience, our resilience means also proactively to build the future. We are not waiting to start the recovery. We are building it. With the leadership of our vice president, as Flavia said, we are, we are thinking on many things. One of those, how to re-industrialize Colombia, how to strengthen our industry, how to strengthen biotechnology in Colombia, how to strengthen our foreign direct investment coming to Colombia to attract and work on reshoring, how to build regional value chains, especially taking advantage on the leadership that President Duque will have this year and the next year being the pro tempore president of Comunidad Andina, pro tempore president of the Pacific Alliance, pro tempore president of ProSur, and also leading the IDB assembly. That's gonna be a very important moment next year. How to strengthen our small and medium enterprises by new ways of funding, for example, using FinTech or crowdsourcing. How to strengthen our small and medium enterprises by improving our e-trade, e-commerce. How to promote service exports with the help of IDB, now we're working on that track, and especially how to promote digital entrepreneurship. How to accelerate the decision and actions in cutting the red tape. How to implement new, invents, new, incent, uh, new investment incentives, including transformation of our free trade zones, or the idea of the social and economic zones that we implemented last year or implementing our uh, special tourism projects, which allow to be faster in the creation of new infrastructure for tourism. How to move faster on IT infrastructure and energy investments. How to build trust, innovation, and sustainability in our tourism sector. Those are part of what we call this recovery plan. And we're seeing results, indexes of confidence growing, increasing demand on energy, better results on industry, the implementation of two days of no value added tax day to certain products to move commerce. Of course, we are in the middle of difficulties, but we are seeing V-shaped numbers in leading indicators of Colombia nowadays. And a way to do it is by building a gradual, progressive, order reactivation or reboot of our productive system after a restrictive lockdown. We can say that today we have allowed to reopen between 75 to 80 percent of our GDP. However, always with responsibility. First health, first lives, and then employment and the economy. The plan to our next future is to continue our path, but in a better normality, a strongest industrial policy, more sustainable tourism, reinforce small and medium enterprises with more involvement on e-trade, more internationalized country, more efficient attraction of investment, Sometimes crisis could be opportunities. And now we think that we have 
many opportunities. Colombia has been the Latin American country which has invested the most as a percentage of its GDP, as a measure to mitigate the effects of the pandemic. But now we see opportunities. Opportunities to be recognized as a country with the strongest investment strategy to recover from the pandemic. And a country with a better strategy to dream on a V-shaped recovery. By doing this, we will resume on our initial track of pro-business, pro-private model, which successfully was building a better environment for investors. One word on this. Even in May, foreign direct investment is growing more than 80% in Colombia. Even in the middle of the pandemic, foreign direct investment is coming to Colombia. Investors still believe in the bright future of Colombia. Why? Because of a sustained economic growth over the past 50 years. Colombia has, was already excelling due to the, this sustained economic growth over the past 50 years. Also, because of our resilient economy, which the World Bank recognizes. And you can see the numbers on this chart. Also because that dynamism explained also on our estimated growth for 2021 and continue interest of investors. But also because of our traditional and previous attractions for investors in the economy, and they are still there. For example, our membership to OECD, which allow us to implement better public policies, which allow us also to a better benchmark to do the right thing in the economy. Also because of our membership to the eighth economy in the world, the Pacific Alliance, which will be led, as I said before, by President Duque in 2021, and which could be the platform for the strongest regional supply chains to uh, solve maybe the problems that we are having nowadays in global supply chains. Also because of the persistent attraction of Colombia as a hub of new investment. As I said before, in 2019, non-mining sector investment is growing 30%. But even in the middle of the pandemic, foreign direct investment is still growing. And also because we think that we can have growing and different sectors, which we can take advantage of them in order to grow on our investment, financial sectors, manufacturing, IT, transportation, tourism, energy, among others. And why is that? because Colombia offers, first of all, a responsible government committed with public health and economic reactivation, because we know that we have to solve the COVID pandemic, but we know also that we have to work on other kinds of possible pandemics. Also because Colombia offers its economic performance, showing a growing middle class with high purchasing power. And we know that we have to protect that middle class. Also because Colombia offers uh, the commitment to improve its competitiveness as a driver for economic growth. Also because Colombia still believes it's a regional export platform. And also because Colombia's government is committed to the growth of the private sector. As I said before, President Duque said last year to you that Colombia wants to be a pro-private initiative country, a pro-business country, and we are still working on that track. Colombia, of course, is prepared for this new challenge, the post-COVID, especially based on our resilient character, but also believes that we have many more opportunities. We were the rising star on growth in Latin America in 2019. And we will emerge as that after the pandemic. That's why I am inviting you, as this video says, 
to protect ourselves now and continue working together in our economic reactivation in the next close future. Thank you very much. Today, all we wish for is to meet once more, just like pauses in music are a key part of the melody. The rhythm of Colombia and our destinations are taking a break so that you may find them renewed, confident that they've taken the best of care and that you'll enjoy them like never before. Because the one thing you can definitely count on is that you'll meet once more with our unshakable rhythm, with our joyful warmth. We'll meet again soon. So we want you to invite, we want to invite you again to Colombia. Now we're taking a break to protect our lives, our health system. And we are expecting all of you to be part of this reactivation plan of the next bright future of Colombia after the COVID-19. Thank you very much. Minister, thank you very much for those remarks. Uh, Michael, over to you, please. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Minister and Pro-Colombia for the invitation. Uh, just to say by way of introduction that I've been asked to do something a little different to the other speakers. I've not been asked to sell Colombia to them. They can do that very capably by themselves. Um, I've been asked to provide some context about what's going on in Latin America in terms of the pandemic, in terms of the politics, the economics and the investment climate to give you as investors uh, a little bit more to look at in terms of judging what Colombia is doing and assessing the opportunity in Colombia relative to the rest of the region. And I will try and do that as objectively as I can with my journalistic hat on. And I'm speaking, of course, in a, in a personal capacity here. Uh, so the views I'm expressing are, are personal rather than the ones of the Financial Times who I write for. Um, so what I'd say to you, first of all, is that this is clearly extremely challenging time. It's a particularly challenging time for Latin America and for Latin American governments. And what the pandemic has done is that it's shone a very bright, harsh and unforgiving light on the region and on its problems and its uh, difficulties. Um, and it's shown up very clearly uh, in the words of the Warren Buffett, the immortal words of Warren Buffett, you know, who is swimming naked when the tide is out. In other words, which countries are the ones that are structurally and in terms of policy doing the right things and well-equipped to cope with a major challenge, and which ones are seriously exposed? And the pandemic is the equivalent of that tide going out and leaving it very clear who is exposed and who is not. Um, I think the pandemic was also somewhat unexpected, it's fair to say, at its ferocity in Latin America. At the moment, uh, horrifyingly, more than 52% of all new deaths globally from COVID-19 are occurring in Latin America, which is a region with only 8% of the world's population. So at present, the pandemic is having a disproportionately big impact on Latin America. And that was quite unexpected. If we think back to February, to the early days of the pandemic, the consensus at that point was that this was hitting Europe and the United States very hard and that Latin America perhaps might escape the worst of it, that perhaps it, it's, its distance from those centers, its more youthful population might permit it to avoid the worst of the pandemic. Well, unfortunately, we've seen that's not been the case. And perhaps in that um, transmission, we've seen the fact that Latin America has particularly close cultural connections with Italy and Spain that were two of the worst hit countries in Europe was obviously something that, that meant the infection spread more quickly into Latin America. Governments then responded uh, in different ways across the continent. And um, I think it's interesting to see that uh, several countries, including Colombia, moved quickly uh, to implement tough lockdowns and to prepare their health services to cope with the challenges of the pandemic. Um, and those countries saw you know, the results of that early on in terms of much lower cases, uh, while other countries that took a different approach, a more laissez-faire approach, a more laid-back approach, saw a rapid rise in the number of cases. However, as the pandemic has evolved, that picture has changed slightly. So, we're still seeing quite different uh, death counts, and I think that the minister was quite right in his presentation to stress the deaths per 100,000 population, because that's probably the most objective uh, statistic that one can use to evaluate performance in the pandemic. The number of cases, as everyone knows, depends very largely on the amount of testing, 
which is varied enormously by country. But deaths are a more comparable statistic, and obviously they should be related to the size of population. I think it's interesting when you look at those numbers to point out that no country in Latin America is so far reaching the levels of the United States, and no country in Latin America is anywhere near the levels of the UK in terms of deaths per 100,000 population. I think that's perhaps a, a, a data point that goes overlooked. Um, but when we look among those Latin American countries, unfortunately, some of the ones that did lock down early, like Chile and Peru, actually have seen quite high death numbers, and in fact, slightly ahead of Brazil and Mexico at this point. Um, we don't know, of course, where this will all end up. But what we do know is that, again, the challenge of this pandemic is that in countries with high degrees of labor informality and significant amounts of poverty, the restrictions that are effective in Europe and in parts of Asia are less effective. Um, and indeed, when you look in Latin America at where the worst cases have occurred, they've tended to occur in poorer areas where people have to go out to eat, have to go out to earn a living, and therefore it, it's, it's more difficult to make a lockdown stick. But I think overall one could say that the, the COVID numbers in Latin America are certainly a sort of X-ray of state effectiveness. Um, there are bright spots. Two of the very brightest spots, in fact, were small countries, uh, Uruguay and Costa Rica, that, that had an outstanding performance um, in terms of what they did against COVID. Though, again, one would have to say probably Uruguay was helped by the fact that it's a much smaller and, and more isolated country with fewer international connections. Um, so that may have played a role too. One of the other big challenges, as the earlier speakers referred to, is the challenge of helping the poor in these situations. And of course, that's a particularly difficult challenge in emerging markets like Latin America because of the fiscal constraints, which are much more serious in developing countries than they are in the developed world. Uh, central banks in Europe, in the United States and in Japan have thrown colossal resources at this pandemic, and they've been able to do it because they have an enormous degree of credibility, uh, because the currencies that they borrow in are backed by investors to a very large extent, and they don't have to worry too much about people stopping buying their bonds or stopping lending to them. Obviously, that's not the case for emerging markets, which have to be much more aware of the need to preserve access to markets, the need to preserve uh, their credit ratings, and, and therefore the amount of, of money, amount of ammunition they've got to tackle this crisis depends quite largely on the fiscal position they were in going into this emergency. And some governments had more room than others. And in Latin America, the ones with the most room, relatively speaking, were Chile and Peru, which had the lowest deficits as a proportion of GDP, um, or debt, debt, debt levels, sorry, as a proportion of GDP. Um, and some others had less space. Brazil, notably, had very little space because it has already quite a high debt level relative to GDP. Argentina, of course, had no space at all. It had already defaulted. Um, and Ecuador was also in in very dire straits. Uh, Colombia was sort of more in the middle there. Um, and of course, they say a big challenge maintaining market access and avoiding debt downgrades. Um, but this brings me to the biggest challenge of all for the pan that the pandemic has posed to Latin America. And again, it's an old problem, the problem of slow growth. Uh, this is a continent as a whole uh, with exceptions, and, and the minister rightly referred to Colombia as one of the better performers uh, over the past decades. But as a continent, Latin America barely grew last year, and indeed its per capita GDP growth for the last five years has been 0.5% on average across the region, which is well below its potential and well below the levels it needs to achieve. Um, and the coronavirus, of course, has highlighted that challenge because we see in the forecasts uh, that were referred to, the IMF and World Bank forecasts, Latin America as a region is one of the worst hit in the world. Uh, in fact, the worst hit emerging market region in the world. And the recovery will be slower in Latin America than in the rest of the world. Again, Colombia is, is among the best performers there, but the region as a whole is being hit hard. So that comes to a little bit of a mystery. And it was a mystery that interested me a lot uh, as someone who'd spent time in East East Asia, observing close up the economies of Southeast Asia, which are at the moment among the world's best performing, um, and which it's worth remembering were poor, backward, rural economies 30 or 40 years ago, well behind Latin America in their level of development, very long way behind. I mean, they weren't even comparable. And yet at the moment, those are economies that are among the world's best performing. So I think it's quite helpful to look at what Latin America as a continent has been doing what Southeast Asia has been doing and draw some conclusions. 
And there's not a great deal of dispute, I think it's fair to say, among economists and policymakers about the reasons. I've talked to quite a lot of them uh, in the course of my work, and they say the similar things. So what you hear most often is that Latin America as a continent suffered uh, an over-reliance on commodity exports. And of course, the boom of the commodities in the first decade of the century was the equivalent of the tide coming in, covering all those naked swimmers, uh, making them look good. But of course, when the commodity boom ended and the tide went out, they were exposed. And that over-reliance on commodity exports is a big problem, particularly, I would say, over-reliance on fossil fuel exports, because of course, the shift to green energy there poses very real challenges. Um, and then coupled to that, you had some other ills that have afflicted this continent. Um, one, poor infrastructure, uh, poor productivity, a high degree of labor informality, and um, what some economists have called premature deindustrialization. In other words, that the region was almost encouraged in the boom years to not bother with industrialization and focus more on commodity exports because they were earning a lot of money and there was a comparative advantage. And it was felt that pursuing industrialization was, was not worthwhile. Well, I think that, that was clearly a mistaken idea. Um, now, those diagnoses have been around for some time. Um, and one of the other ones, of course, that goes with it is the question of inequality, which the minister rightly referred to. Uh, there's a serious problem of inequality in Latin America. It's the world's most unequal continent in terms of the distribution of income. Um, and one of the reasons for that is a low tax base. Um, the average amount uh, of tax raised in Latin America is 23% of GDP raised in taxes. And the average for OECD countries is 34%. So just that one statistic really tells you a lot about why Latin America struggles to provide high quality public services. It's because a large amount, uh, not enough money essentially is coming into the budget from taxation and therefore there isn't enough available. And then sometimes what does come in is not always spent on the right things. And again, I'm talking here at the level of the continent. So quite often you can see too much spent on, for example, public sector pensions, which are in some countries, very generous. Brazil was one of the countries that's tried to tackle that problem with the pension reform last year. Um, but of course, if you're spending your money on pensions, you're not spending it on things like health and education, which are investments in the workers of today and the workers of tomorrow, and other places where you would want to be spending a lot more of your, of your um, funds. So that's one of the key challenges for Latin America. How do you raise the tax base? How do you raise government revenues? And then how do you make sure that that money is spent wisely on health, on education, and on infrastructure, which are sort of the keys to unlocking investment and economic potential? And when we come to infrastructure, um, there's another challenge for the continent. In general, infrastructure in Latin America is not as good as it should be. And that makes life, of course, harder for investors and for exporters and makes industries less competitive globally and exporters less competitive globally. Um, so there's a big challenge there around improving that. And it was good to hear the minister talking about infrastructure investment and infrastructure projects that are available for investors, because this is clearly key to uh, improving uh, the environment for, for business. And we know too from studies that have been done by banks like the IDB, the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, that Colombia is actually one of the countries where infrastructure investment would make the biggest difference in terms of competitiveness uh, and the biggest sort of boost to the economy. So clearly every dollar or peso invested in infrastructure in Colombia is going to deliver a disproportionate benefit. One of the other areas I'd highlight is technology investment and uh, rollout of 5G, which is one of the crucial technologies of tomorrow. Um, it's disappointing to see that we don't have Latin American nations among the global leaders at the moment in 5G. Let's hope that'll change. Um, but the rollout in Latin America is not going as fast as it is, for example, in Southeast Asia, or even in parts of the Middle East, where I, I've seen studies suggesting that the United Amer Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia are among the, the global leaders in 5G. South Korea was very fast on it, China, obviously, uh, but also even places like Australia and Romania. Um, so there's a challenge to get 5G rolled out quickly and also to get broadband to the 200 million Latin Americans that don't have it. Um, 
And then I would also highlight sort of the labor informality. How do you reduce that? Because we've seen in the pandemic just what a problem it is when you have such a large informal labor force uh, in everything from how you get them subsidies and benefits to how you make sure they can observe a lockdown when they're not earning money. Um, the regulation, the ease of doing business index, where again, if you look uh, at the World Bank's data, uh, Southeast Asia uh, among the world leaders, better than a lot of European countries on the ease of doing business, uh, countries like Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, all in the top 20 uh, for ease of doing business. Latin America is sort of you know, between 59 and 126 in terms of global ease of doing business. Um, Colombia at 67. So, you know, that's an area where clearly um, more can be done that would help. Um, and I think the minister's quite right to highlight the opportunity uh, presented by the pandemic. It's quite right to think of this as an opportunity to be grasped, to be taken advantage of, and uh, which can lead to better things and a better future if, if policy is, is directed in the right direction. And this comes to trade. Um, this is the Asian century. Um, I've lived in Asia for two and a half years recently. Uh, I've seen it close up. There's no question about it. Asia's share of the global economy more than doubled in the last 20 years, and it's going to double again probably in the next 20. So one of the key questions for Latin America has to be, where is the continent positioned for trade with Asia? Uh, the minister mentioned the Pacific Alliance, which is clearly going to be an important part of it. And I think learning from the uh, nations of Southeast Asia is, is another important part of it. These were, as I said, countries that were poor rural economies 30 years ago, not even comparable to Latin America, and are now among global leaders. Another area that I think is, is key uh, is uh, green uh, investment and sustainable investment. Uh, and it was good to hear uh, mentioned possibilities for investment in, in, in uh, clean energy projects. This is clearly crucial um, and is going to become a bigger and bigger trend. Latin America has some big advantages. It's got abundant resources of solar and wind, as well as hydro, of course. There's no reason for Latin America to use dirty energy. And so the quicker it can transition to clean energy, the better, the quicker it can electrify its mass transit systems and its, its vehicles, the better. Um, and, and also, I think it goes beyond that. It goes into things like sustainable investing and the whole sustainability movement in investing is becoming very big. It's gaining enormous momentum um, and is, is becoming a very important part of the investment world. Uh, and I think it's quite right, as Colombia is doing, to think about that. I know that the Colombian stock exchanges have been looking at this too. Um, investors more and more around the world will be asking how companies perform on sustainability metrics. And so the countries that take that seriously uh, and incorporate it into company reporting and stock exchange disclosure are going to have big advantages over the countries that don't. And clearly diversifying the economy, I'd say finally, we mentioned infrastructure, that's the key really an education to unlocking a diversification, moving away from raw material exports, uh, developing good quality ports, airports and road roads that allow exporters to compete, that allow reindustrialization. Southeast Asia understands this. I don't want to harp on too much about them, but the infrastructure boom underway in Southeast Asia is truly colossal. I've mentioned just one country, Indonesia, which is a middle-income country, spending more than $100 billion on infrastructure projects that are already underway. I mean, really incredible ambition in Southeast Asia, high-speed train networks everywhere, state-of-the-art airports. I mean, they're, you know, they're thinking very big on infrastructure, and I think that's right. And I think uh, it's good for Latin America to try to do the same. That's going to give the opportunities uh, post-pandemic. Um, so I just say finally, uh, by way of conclusion, that I think we don't want to think, you know, we want to remember this pandemic is not going to dominate our lives forever. It's dominated them for the last six months, but it won't do so forever. Uh, maybe it'll be another six months, another year or two we'll be talking about it, probably not much longer after that. And we could perhaps draw a little bit of encouragement from the Spanish flu, which was the great pandemic of 1918, killed 50 million people. It was devastating. It, it infected one in three people in the world. How many people talk now about the Spanish flu of 1918? It's almost forgotten. We hear about World War I, World War II endlessly. I've yet to see a film or read a book about the Spanish flu of 1918. It's forgotten completely. So let's hope that that is what happens to COVID-19, that it becomes forgotten completely. 
and that we can concentrate instead on building a, a better and more competitive future for Latin America, uh, where we see greater prosperity for all and a more competitive and better connected Latin America doing more business around the world, especially with the fast growing countries of Asia. So with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, hand back to you, Oliver. Thank you very much, Michael. And, and I think I speak for everybody um, on this call when I say we all hope you're right on that last point. Uh, and I think you are right. And I think that's ultimately uh, going to be where, where this is headed. Um, thank you both for your very excellent uh, presentations and the insight, uh, Minister uh, Michael, as well, um, for the great overview. So, so why don't we dive right into the conversation? Just a quick reminder to anybody um, listening in on the call, you can submit questions in the chat function in the app. Uh, we'll try to obviously address as many of those as we can. Um, so please go ahead and, and, and submit those. Uh, Minister, maybe a question for you to just kick it off at the beginning. You mentioned in your presentation this longer trajectory that Colombia was already on prior to the, the COVID pandemic, 50 years of growth, basically, among others, despite, as we know, um, some, some very significant um, sort of historical troubles on the political security side, um, especially. Um, as you look at it today, as you look at that growth trajectory where do you see the biggest risks to that trajectory? And what is the government doing about managing those risks to ensure that we actually continue on that path towards more growth and prosperity? Thank you, Oliver. Maybe maybe you see two kinds of risks. Maybe one, I would say there are international risks, and this is a risk for the whole humanity. Are we moving towards a more protectionist world? or a more multilateral world. And I think that there is a dilemma for the future of humanity. In our opinion, we need to move to a more multilateral world. Of course, in which free trade should be uh, understood for all. And I think that uh, in order to move on that track, we need a lot of leadership. What are we doing on that? As I said before, President Duque will be the leader of Pacific Alliance, Comunidad Andina, also president of the Assembly of IDB, ProSur. That's an extraordinary opportunity to lead Latin America towards multilateralism. The other risk is, uh, as I call it, maybe a local risk. Because I think that COVID has an unexpected consequence in terms of destroying what we have done in the past, in terms of destroying poverty, building employment, building our middle class. So I think that we need a lot of effort in order to protect those achievements that we had in the past. How to do it? By a social and by an active social policy that we need to implement. Currently, we are doing that. More than 30 million people of Colombia, up to 50 million people, are receiving active social policy nowadays. But apart from that, we need to protect maybe the majority of our firms, small and medium enterprises. So we have to be very um, active and concerned about the future of those SMEs in, in Colombia. And, and finally, because I don't want just to give the risks or the troubles, I think that we could also have challenges and especially opportunities. Challenges on how to continue facilitating uh, investment, facilitated bus businesses in Colombia. How to diversify and increase our export basket of Colombia. And how to move faster on the introduction of foreign industrial revolution strategies in Colombia. And we are working on that. We, we have just launched for example, a mission on interna internationalization with Professor Hausman, for example. We just launched last year our Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution working on that track. And maybe opportunities, opportunities on reshoring, opportunities on regional building regional value chains. And, and especially, as Michael said before, the opportunity to build in this uh, better normality a more sustainable growth for Colombia. A sustainable growth, uh, growth of Colombia, which could take into account our human talent, our biodiversity, 
So I think that those are not only risks, but also opportunities and challenges for this next bright future. Fantastic. Thank you, Minister. And, and we'll definitely get back to some of those points that you mentioned there, particularly on the, the opportunities and challenges as well later in the conversation. But Michael, maybe off the back of your um, regional comments where you're sort of outlining a little bit how Colombia has fared regionally. Um, maybe I'd like to explore a bit a bit more specifically just on the Colombian case. I mean, you, you and I have spoken about this. You lived in Colombia back in the 1980s, um, I believe it was. Um, if if uh, when you first came to Colombia, you had forecast uh, that not only was Colombia uh, within a matter of 10 years going to beat Argentina 5-0 at soccer, uh, they would also within a generation <laughs> move ahead of Argentina in terms of foreign direct investment and uh, neighboring Venezuela would become at the end of that same generation a failed state basically. Uh, you probably would have made a lot of friends locally, um, but you might have found yourself out of a job fairly quickly at the time. None of those things were particularly feasible. What happened? How did we get here? How can you, looking at some of those regional dynamics, specifically analyze the Colombian case and what made some of those things happen? Maybe not the 5 nil, but especially on some of the political <laughs> and, and other developments. Yes, thank you, Oliver. Well, I'm not a soccer expert, so I should definitely steer clear of the football analysis. But uh, it's true. I came to Colombia first in 1984 uh, to teach English uh, in a town in the south of Colombia called Neva um, at the university. Um, and it was my first encounter with Latin America, and it was a you know a difficult time for Colombia. It was a time when there were not just you know, one but several guerrilla forces who were uh, waging war on the government. Uh, the economy was closed. It was quite small. Uh, the level of development was was nowhere near where it is today. And the country was facing also serious challenges from. Um, from drug trafficking, which had just started to take off, and the violence that was associated with it was just starting to begin. So um, you would have been a very brave person in, in 1984 to have predicted that this country would end up being one of the most successful in Latin America over a sustained 40-year you know, period from that time. Yet, in fact, that's exactly what happened. And um, also, when I was in Colombia as a correspondent in the early 1990s, I mean, we saw then the beginning of the opening of the economy, the trade liberalization that was pursued under the Gaviria administration, which was the beginning of that important internationalization, um, uh, which, which contributed a lot to Colombia, the, the awareness of, of foreign investment and its importance. But also, of course, the early 90s was a time when, when Colombia was still economically in Venezuela's shadow, which seems something incredible when you look at today. But in the 90s, um, most multinational companies uh, had their Andean headquarters in Caracas. Uh, ours did. I was working for Reuters at the time, and the Andean region was headquartered in Caracas. That was common for most countries. Venezuela was the sort of rich relative next door to Colombia. Uh, and again, you would have been a very brave person in, in 1993 or four to predict that Venezuela, 25 years on, would be a failed state living in misery and poverty, uh, a fraction of its former self, and that Colombia would be the undisputed regional champion, drawing in many Venezuelans who want to work there and to benefit from the Colombian economy. Uh, yet again, that's what happened. So to your question, why did it happen? Well, I think that the, the, the most clear reason was sound public policy, sound government policy over a long period. And Colombia has been very fortunate in avoiding some of the very radical zigzagging in policy, which we've seen in other Latin American countries, where you've had a sort of tug of war between the hard left and the right, and policies changing every four years or every eight years, often quite violently. Um, Colombia has largely avoided that. There's been quite a high degree of consensus around economic policy, particularly in economic management, uh, quite a technocratic approach uh, informed by internationally educated experts in places like the finance ministry and the central bank. And that's been crucial to, to its success. I would say, too, though, of course, that these things are not guaranteed forever. Uh, we live in, in democracy, thankfully, but democracy also brings risks, particularly in these times of populism. So one of the challenges for any government now is to make sure that the population appreciate the benefits that that technocratic approach brings and that those benefits can be clearly demonstrated to the population so you don't run the risk of uh, an irresponsible demagogue winning power and, and, and tearing up all those achievements and, and following irresponsible policies, which, of course, has been the case in, in some other Latin American nations. 
Thanks, Michael. And that's definitely one that uh, that we'll get back to as well, because it is a question that we frequently get asked as well um, by our clients looking at um, investing in Colombia, just to some of those comparisons to regional neighbors. And it is curious that Colombia has just managed to steer clear of, of sort of that um, uh, that left right uh, Football. I'm just going to go back with the football, um, kicking back and forth between the, the ideological extremes. Um, so I think that's definitely something um, to, to highlight and, and the points that you make are excellent there. Um, and we'll discuss a little bit later just in terms of some of the, the, the impact of, of COVID on that. And, and I don't want to sort of maybe necessarily um, spend too much time specifically on the pandemic. Uh, Minister uh, Restrepo in particular, you, you mentioned a, quite a, a, a few ways, 165, I believe, um, is the precise number in which the government is tackling uh, the pandemic, things that are being done to um, um, make sure that the fallout is perhaps um, controlled a bit more. I would ask sort of maybe related to this question and about the the, uh, the bigger picture um, politics almost, um, if you look at some of the measures that Colombia has been able to take on the fiscal side, on some of the regulatory side as well, and, and you compare perhaps with some of your regional neighbors, um, why has Colombia been able to, to take some of those measures and what does that mean for foreign investors looking at the country from a bigger sort of bigger picture, longer term perspective? What does it mean that Colombia has been able to do those things from a perspective of its government, but also from the country as a whole and its people? As I was telling you before, we were working on at least three moments. The first moment is the, what I call it, the very short term. In that very short term, the priorities have been First of all, health. So how to invest more on the health system to improve on traceability, also to improve on testing. And because of that, now we also moved to another priority, which has been how to invest on the most vulnerable people. And finally, how to invest on how to sustain employment. How and why we could be able to do that. Of course, because we used to have in the past a very uh, consistent macroeconomic policy, which allowed us maybe to increase a little bit our debt compared to the GDP. So we have enough space to invest on those kind of mitigation programs. The, the second part of what we have done is maybe the reactivation uh, uh, of sectors. And in, in, in that track, what we're doing is how to allow new sectors to be open in order to move from the lockdown to the new normality or the better normality. How can we could be able to do that? Well, because of course we have done uh, a special work, interesting work on health issues. So we are we were able to prove and to show good results on health uh, in terms of mortality, uh, in terms of the rate of people who get infected. So we could be able to open gradually those sectors. And finally, the, the last track is how to move to the next step or to the, um, the, to the next uh, uh, maybe challenge, which is how to grow on this idea of a B shape. And, and, and to do that, of course, we can do that because, because of the experience that we had in the past or the lessons that we had in the past in uh, spaces such as the Pacific Alliance, in uh, the lessons that we had in terms of how to grow even in difficult situations that we, we had in the past of our country. Thank you, uh, Minister, for the for the overview. Um, so maybe we let's uh, focus a little bit for the remainder of the session um, on precisely the opportunities um, that um, everybody has mentioned here that obviously are the key focus of uh, not only this session, but also the next several days. And, and one of the uh, potential main opportunities that we've seen being discussed, uh, frankly, globally is um, the pandemic being sort of this accelerant of digital transformation, right? The digitalization of economies. Minister, you yourself mentioned uh, digital entrepreneurship and, and e-commerce um, sort of as key mechanisms as part of the government's plan um, for recovery and then further growth. Um, perhaps just um, um, following up with you actually um, first before we shoot it back to Michael, but where does the 5G in particular feature on that plan? Where does Colombia stand on 5G and, 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 and frankly, what can it do to accelerate the process of implementation? Actually, it's part of the most important policy now on the IT ministership. And actually, we are moving on that track. 
uh, we have to especially start by increasing the coverage of uh, this uh, connectivity all around Colombia, but we, we are also on that track of building the idea of 5G in, in Colombia. So actually we're moving on that track. And as, as you said, one of the main maybe outcomes of this crisis is how e-commerce has increased a lot in Colombia. During the last two months, more than 80% is the growth of e-commerce in Colombia. And that's also an opportunity to, for example, strengthen small and medium enterprises, but also it could be an opportunity to build from informality to formality. What are we doing on that track? First, building a policy. In Colombia, we call it COMPES, which is a social and economic policy. Now, the, the new policy is uh, being for consultations, is, is developed and is open for consultation. Secondly, articulate and organize all the different strategies that we have in the public and local governments on E-Trade, which is also quite relevant, and changing regulatory issues in terms of uh, e-commerce. So we're working on that track. 5G is, uh, it could be an opportunity to, to strengthen what we're doing now, but we think that that uh, idea of e-commerce is going to be one of the most interesting consequences of COVID-19. Thank you, Minister. Um, Michael, in, in your remarks, you mentioned, of course, um, the, you called it the, the Asian century, having lived in that region, you studied it very closely and still do. Um, you mentioned uh, some of the ways in which countries in especially Southeast Asia are making and have made significant headway in terms of, of sort of economic growth and the path towards prosperity, um, infrastructure, obviously a key one, but also clearly the digital economy, another one of those. Um, a, a third um, point that has been also frankly mentioned by the minister and you touched upon as well, those trade agreements. Um, obviously, those are fundamental, and it's a complicated time, perhaps, to to sort of really focus on more trade agreements and more globalization, as the minister himself mentioned at the beginning, in terms of some of those key risks to the plan on the international side. But where do you see trade agreements featuring, and perhaps do you have a thought or two about uh, TPP in particular as um, a potential sort of um, something for Colombia to, to look at more closely and more quickly? Thanks, Oliver. Well, I think... Um Trade agreements are crucial, and here there's an opportunity for Latin America. I mean, the minister quite rightly mentioned the risk of protectionism, but actually here Latin America can make common cause with Asia, because Asia thinks exactly the same way as Latin America on this. Asia wants open free trade, and the Asians these days are the biggest champions of free trade around the world. Uh, it's the Europeans and the Americans who are more concerned about, about unlimited free trade, particularly the Americans, actually, and the British, um, because you've got uh, populists in power who came to power partly by promising the less well-off in their countries that they would uh, be more nationalistic. That's not a problem in Asia. So I think there's a great opportunity for uh, Latin America to draw closer to Asia, to negotiate more free trade agreements with Asia. Um, and the minister mentioned the Pacific Alliance. I think you know, another block, of course, that is gaining ground in Asia is the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, which is another important regional block. Um, and the minister might want to talk to us about what plans Colombia has in, in relation to the TPP. Um, but I think that's the sort of area that Latin America can be thinking about, um, you know, how to draw nearer to Asia in terms of free trade deals and free trade alliances, because they're thinking very much the same way. They see the same opportunities. Thanks, Michael. Actually, Minister, why don't we, why don't we do that, give you quickly the opportunity to, to talk about TPP? Okay. First of all, I mean, I have to say something because one of the uh, policies that we uh, are implementing in Colombia and one of the commitments of President Ivan Duque was not to open a new negotiation, uh, but to take advantage of all the FTAs that we have in place or in negotiating now in Colombia. So we're following that track. That's a commitment that, we, that he had in his campaign. So what we're doing now is how to take advantage of all the 16 FTAs that we have by doing many things, especially trade, uh, diplomacy, or even facilitation uh, in the process of admissibility to many countries. And we were, we were having results at, at the first three months of this year, for example, agro-industry products in terms of exports were growing even though the difficult situation all around the world. So 
Uh, talking about the, the CTPP, what we are doing is we maybe are preparing the country, but uh, within this government, what we are going to do is taking advantage of the FTAs that we have, because we think that we have still space to take advantage of that, taking advantage of blocks such as the Pacific Alliance, maybe having the opportunity to develop and successfully finish the negotiations that we were having now in place in the Pacific Alliance with some countries, finishing also the negotiation with Japan and implementing the new FTA with Israel. Those are the main and prioritized uh, strategies and uh, goals that we have now in Colombia. Thank you, Minister. And we are coming up on time uh, very rapidly, um, but perhaps actually, um, Flavia, a question to you since you sort of uh, kicked us off at the beginning, and maybe this is a good uh, good question that came out of the audience to, to close it out, um, is specifically around, um, I guess, uh, not only ProColombia, but the, the coming government, uh, broadly speaking, and some of those key strategies to attracting foreign investors actually how are you how is the government working to to convince investors uh, to come into colombia what are some of the key points that maybe you could highlight on that front thank you oliver i think that what we are doing right now it's uh, we as the minister mentioned we have been resilient so uh, our promotion that it was uh, a different promotion 4 months ago has changed into virtual uh, into virtual meetings like this one this opportunity like the investment brochure uh, give us a great chance to show uh, the investors in UK and in Europe projects like 74 projects that we're showing in this time. So right now what we are doing is that we are in the reactivation process as the ministry was, was mentioning and we're working very hard in promoting not only the investment opportunities that in Colombia we have in the different regions, in the different sectors, but we're also promoting the best uh, goods and services from Colombia with uh, added value so we can show the world that Colombia can be the, lead, the regional leader for exports, can be the regional leader for investments, and we're working very hard also, so whenever we get the chance to bring back all the international tourists into our country. So we are working uh, with uh, virtual tools, we are working uh, in promoting using our 23 offices that we have around the world that covers 30, 32 countries, but also we are working uh, in a program that it is very, very successful with our ambassadors all around the world. In Europe, I will really would like to take this opportunity to thank our ambassadors that are in UK, in Germany, in the different countries, in France, in Spain, that they really work very hard uh, in a program that is called Conectados to help us promote the country for the investment opportunities like in this case. Thank you very much, Flavia. Um, and with that, actually, I do believe we are basically at time. Um, Jose, uh, why don't you uh, take it from here just for some closing remarks? And I know you also have a reminder that this is not uh, by any stretch of the imagination uh, the last webinar. It's the first one to kick us off. I thought it was great. Thank you all for your very insightful comments and for the good discussion. And I hope everybody that dialed in uh, thought it was worth their while. Uh, thank you very much, Jose. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver, for... Um for steering us during this webinar and for leading what I believe was a very interesting discussion. <clears throat> Certainly very, very promising for what comes with um, uh, during the next following days. Many thanks as well to our minister, Jose Manuel Restrepo, to our president, Flavia Santoro, and to Michael Stott from the FT for their very valuable contributions. Uh, we are very glad to have had such an amazing audience today. Uh, let me tell you that more than uh, 250 people joined the event, and I hope you and many others join again us tomorrow for our second webinar of this Columbia Investment Roadshow, titled The Role of Infrastructure and Energy in a Post-COVID Era in Colombia." Again at uh, 1 p.m. British time and 2 p.m. Central European time. Uh, tomorrow's webinar will allow us to, to, to deep, do a deep dive into these two sectors. Uh, if you want to register for these webinars, please visit the event webpage. And um, again, uh, for those of you, uh, if you're an investor that have not requested a one-to-one -one meeting with Colombian project developers, remember we have more than 70 projects uh, available for that. Please do so using the chat box below or visiting um, the webpage where instructions will be provided.
Once again, thank you very much to all of you in the audience. Thanks to the speakers. Thank you, Oliver, for, for steering us. And everyone have a very nice rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.